Hello and welcome to another instalment of History Hack. Alina, is, she's even more excitable and puppy dog like today than she usually is. Tell everybody why, Alina. I am so excited today because we have the amazing, amazing, amazing Frank Madonna with us. He is a historian. Come on, if you people don't know who he is, just go away. But anyway, he's a historian, an author, a broadcaster, and you probably recognise him from his On This Day daily post on Twitter. He has written some fantastic books like The Gestapo, The Myth and the Reality of Hitler's Secret Police, The Hitler Years, Triumph, 1933 to 1939, which is the first part in a two-part series. And of course, his newest book, The Hitler Years, Disaster, 1940 to 1945, which is out this week. Hi, Fr- Hi, Lena. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm okay. I'm, I'm coping with lockdown, the long days, the days stretch out, you know. It's like the it, it's like that book, The Longest Day, but it goes on forever. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Frank, we're so happy. I'm finally you're on this podcast because I've been dying to get you on, and now we have a prime excuse to have you talk to us. But what we've actually done is we're going to do some of that usual book chatter. But what we've done is we've asked you to come up with five things from this new book that you've written because you're going to do about a hundred of these podcasts they're going to be the same questions. It's, we don't want to bore our listeners with the same old podcast. So we've decided to do something a lot more fun. Haven't we, Alex? Yeah. So we're going to, we've let Frank pick five things that he thinks are really important about the book and he's going to tell us about them, but we are going to do like the book housekeeping first, aren't we? So as I understand it, Frank, this book, um, what you're trying to do and what you have done is take away the sort of Hollywood perspective on Hitler. Um, But tell us what makes your book different to let's say Richard Evans or Ian Kershaw who've also sort of done Third Reich stuff? Well my book is different because uh, first of all uh, neither Evans nor Kershaw concentrate just on the years that Hitler was in power. So for example Kershaw's biographies remember they're not they're not histories of the Third Reich they're biographies. Um, You know I I think you know about three quarters of his first book is about Hitler's early life. Um, so I, I, and Evans's book is, uh, books are thematic. So basically, Evans is not looking at the history of the Third Reich as a narrative. He actually splits it up into different thematic aspects. So, you know, in his books, there's chapters on women, there's chapters on youth, there's chapters on propaganda. Mm-hmm. Um foreign policy and I don't do it like that and again he has three volumes one of which looks at the period before 1933 and then he looks at 33 to 39 and then he looks at 39 to 45 but again they're thematic books um my book is different from those two books in the it, different from from Evans in that it's a narrative and his is a thematic book different from Kershaw in that it's not a biography it's a history of Germany in this period when when Hitler was in power so it doesn't just cover Hitler it covers you know social uh, policy it covers you know uh, propaganda it covers the Jews the persecution of the Jews is a big theme of the two books and also it actually looks at, at the Third Reich in a different way in the sense that it looks at every year of the Third Reich. So every chapter is a year. So basically, instead of, you know, a a sort of obtuse title of a chapter where, you know, you go on with no real sort of chronological sense of the chapter, all these chapters do have a chronology. They all start on the 1st of January, and they go all the way through the year until the 31st of December. So that's really different. There's no other, there's no other book on the Third Reich that does that. So you that came way. up five, <laughs> <laughs> five, five points you gave us. Um, the first one you come up with was the decision to attack the Soviet Union, which was in December 1940. Why did you choose that time period? Because I think that most of the books that deal with the wartime period, they tend to focus on the Western aspect of the war. So we look at the war in a different way from, you know, as a historian, I like to look at, I like to look at a problem 
in the round. I don't like to take what is a kind of accepted view and just say, okay, I'll look at it this way. I'll write a book about D-Day and the Battle of Britain and, you know, and, and Winston Churchill, you know, waving from 10 down the street and that, that and, and sort of, and the Americans come in and they win the war. Yeah. You know, the Hollywood version of the war is something I don't want, I didn't want to get into because the, the Second World War and Germany's role in the Second World War, remember, is what I'm concentrating on. So that, that means it's a different focus. So I start off, obviously, I start off with Germany defeating France and, of course, uh, the, the, the retreat at Dunkirk. And then I look at the Battle of Britain. And then I actually look at the way that Hitler tried to forge some kind of anti uh, German alliance, and then I show at the end of that year, which is the first issue, 1940. At the end of that year, he decides to attack the Soviet Union, and I see this as a crucial part of the beginning of of what he sees as central to his war, if you like, the war that he mentions in Mein Kampf, the war with the Soviet Union. So the war with the Soviet Union plays a huge role in the German war. So when you take up a book on the history of the Second World War, you do expect a lot of the focus to be on the West. But the focus of this book is where Germany went and where Germany's troops were deployed. So a hell of a lot of it features the German-Soviet War, which was the biggest war within the war, if you like. I mean, for example, four out of every five German soldiers who died in the Second World War were killed by a Russian soldier it gives you some idea of, of how intense that war was. And I also, that was important to show that Hitler comes back, really, from this great triumph of defeating France, humili- humiliating France, really. I mean, really, he humiliated Britain, really. I mean, I know, we ha- I know Winston Churchill goes on radio and says, yeah, we'll, we'll fight them in the streets, we'll fight them in the landing grounds. You know, the truth of the matter was that, you know, we, we had to retreat at Dunkirk. Dunkirk was really, and and... You know, Churchill knew this really privately. You know, he said privately, you know, you don't win a war by running away. You don't win a war by, you know, by scuttling away from the enemy. He said, at some point, we've got to re-engage on the continent if we want to win this war. And that didn't look likely in 1940. It didn't look likely that Britain could win the war. But at the same time, Britain wasn't in as much danger. I think I bring out in this book that... Britain wasn't in as much danger as we would think. And the key to that was Britain's Navy. Britain's Navy and also the build-up of Britain's fighter aircraft and its defences. Germany, although Hitler did have a kind of half-hearted plan called Operation Sea Lion, he he really realised that, you know, that it was going to be impossible to invade Britain, really. And uh, I think that we overestimate the idea that Britain was in that much danger. It wasn't really in that much danger of a German invasion. I mean, you know, the Germans were about to invade. They, they, they created barges, but these barges were really unstable. You know, and we had like, you know, five battleships were there, 300 destroyers, you know, tons of submarines, uh, you know, with fighter aircraft. The chances of of having a successful invasion of Britain by Germany was pretty much impossible. It would have taken... Well, Frank, um, Phil Weir came on to talk about the Navy's contribution to the Battle of Britain and kind of said, if you look at the numbers and and what Germany put into it, that was never a serious effort to try and invade Britain. No, it wasn't. It was. And and also, they know, people like Admiral Raider, he knew that. He advised in, in the discussions over... Uh, Operation Sea Lion, which go on in July. Admiral Raider says, look, you know, we are never going to be able to get naval superiority. He said, to get air superiority, you also need naval superiority if you're going to mount an invasion. And those are the two things that don't get joined up in the usual way that the Battle of Britain is is treated. You need to harmonise those two things. You need to harmonise the naval dominance of of Britain with the growing fighter aircraft defence. Put the two together and, you know, Britain's victory in the Battle of Britain was inevitable and Germany's decision to not attack Britain was also inevitable. You know, Hitler might have been able to invade Britain, but he would have needed to have planned it for two or three years. 
and he would have therefore needed not to invade the Soviet Union. So the invasion of the Soviet Union I see as pivotal because it's his biggest mistake, really. Um, not that he invades as well. I, I, don't, I don't go for the traditional interpretation that it was all ideological, that he, that he hated communism. It was all his hatred of communism and Mein Kampf, and it drew him towards attacking the Soviet Union. In fact, he keeps saying to his generals uh, before the, the Battle of the Soviet Union and during the German-Soviet War, I want the economic resources of the Soviet Union. I want the oil. I want the wheat of the Ukraine. So in a sense, it's not just ideological in that way. When we come to ideology, his key ideological aim is to get rid of Jewish people. And mm -hmm. that comes out in the book as well. His key passion, uh, you know, his ideological passion is to is to get rid of Jews from the face of the earth because he feels as though if they can be got rid of from the face of the earth, then Germany can dominate the world. That's part of it. You know, he needs to get rid of the Soviet Union, but he doesn't really see the Soviet Union as like sort of a dangerous enemy at the start. He thinks the Soviet Union, as he says, you know, before the attack, you know, it's like, it's like a pack of cards. Just push it and they'll fall over. Everybody underestimates it. Which takes us on to your second point, which is you've said, like sticking with the fact that this is the biggest war within the war. The next point you've picked up as being like a, the key, one of the keystones to your book is the counteroffensive by the Red Army outside Moscow in 1940. Yes, that's the second, you know, that, that's the second pivotal moment because he goes ahead with the attack on the Soviet Union. And it is an enormous attack. When you look at the attack on the Soviet Union, it's the biggest military attack ever mounted in the history of warfare. It's the biggest military uh, assault of the entire Second World War. And by a long way, you know, you're talking about something like 3.5 million uh, troops are involved in that attack. It'll give you a, a, you know, a comparison. You know, 156,000 troops are involved in D-Day. So, you know, you're talking 3.5 million versus 156,000. And so it's, it's a massive attack. And it's an attack all across the frontier of the Soviet Union with the German army split into three, Army Group A, Army Group B, Army Group C. And the aim, one of their aims is to take Moscow. Interestingly enough, it's not Hitler's aim. And I bring that out in the book and I show that Hitler is all too aware of the Napoleon trap and he says, you know, I don't want to get into that Napoleon trap of thinking I have to take the Soviet Union to win the war. He actually tells his generals, I'd like to take the Ukraine and the Caucasus, get the oil and get the wheat that we need economically to continue the war. And his generals want the prize of taking out uh, Stalin and Moscow. Now, you know, there is an argument to say that the generals were right there. You know, if Stalin's regime had fallen, and he had taken out Moscow, there's a good chance he could have won the German-Soviet War. Not, not to say that he, even if he did that, by the way, he would have won the Second World War, because waiting in the wings is America. <laughs> you know, and America and Britain, you know, are well enough equipped to take on Hitler's Third Reich. In fact, the war potential of America is bigger than any, any, any other combatant in the war itself. Now, if we look at it on paper, yes, Hitler's not that afraid of America. And who would be? You know, in 1941, America's, you know, got an army of, you know, less, less than a million men. It hasn't got huge armaments at that stage. But America has the factories and the workers and the industrial capability to have war potential that dwarfs the other, the other powers in the war. By 1944... America is producing something like 50% of all the world's armaments. That shows you it's a sleeping giant, America, in that way. So really, although he wants to take out the Soviet Union in 1941, he does need to take them out. And really, the, the sort of the beginning of the kind of masterstroke of the Red Army is Zhukov. Uh, Georgi Zhukov, he's, he's the... He's the, he's the uh, the Soviet commander who really has this idea that, you know, the Germans have, have stretched their army too far. They're moving too far away from their supply lines. Remember, the Blitzkrieg was okay in Western Europe. Good roads, 
good communications. Uh, in the Soviet Union, the terrain is, is enormous, stretches on forever. There are no motorways. You know, it's not really great terrain for an army that moves, you know, on wheels, which, which the German army does. It's, it's more difficult. And Zhukov himself, you know, he starts to think, right, how can we really, how can we really turn the tide here? And he thinks, if we can counterattack them at Moscow and send them back, it's going to be a huge psychological blow. And he said, even if we only send them back 60 miles, he said, we'll send them back with their tail between their legs and they'll really start to think this is going to be much tougher than we thought it was. And Hitler, when the, when the, the counteroffensive happens, you know, and he brings up, for example, um, he brings up his Siberian troops as well, who are skilled in uh, fighting in, in ice cold conditions. He brings them up as well. And he, he mounts this masterstroke. He actually starts it on the 5th of December, 1941. So before America enters the war, the war is tilted. Once Hitler is stopped at Moscow, Stalin will survive. And if Stalin survives, the Soviet Union will survive as well. And from that point on, you know, the seeds are being sown now for what is going to become a titanic struggle an absolutely titanic struggle. I mean, in my book, even writing the book, um, I couldn't believe the, 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 the ferocity of these battles. The ferocity of the battles on the Eastern Front are like, they're like the difference between a bare-knuckle fight and a fight fought under Queensbury rules with gloves on. The gloves are off in the, in the Soviet Union. The brutality of it, the, 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 you know, the way that, you know, each army d d deals with, you know, it's basically like someone has said, you know, it, it's like the Wild West. Who's going to win? You know, and, and even then, even in 1941, Hitler starts to think these people, you know, are, are fighting for more than communism. They're fighting for patriotism. And that's the thing about the Soviet Union and the Second World War. We tend to think, you know, oh, it's a, it's a communist regime. But the public go back to their ancient love of, of their um, motherland, you know, and, and, and they fight back. And really, that's the first big turning point. And of course, it was a huge shock. The world held its breath. You know, the world held its breath in 1941. And when they heard that the Soviet Union had mounted a counterattack, not only was Hitler flabbergasted, Churchill was flabbergasted because he thought the Soviet Union was going was gonna to be defeated. So I would say that's the big, big turning point of the war. Right. I'm going to backtrack you a little bit because you've mentioned this already. And this is, funny enough, your third point. And that is the decision to declare war on the USA in December 1941, because we always hear about the Japanese declaring war, but we never really talk about what Germany did. Yes, well, I think that that's another significant moment in, in the Second World War. And it comes sort of a couple of days after the Soviet counteroffensive. So you could say, you know, Hitler, Hitler wins the war, loses the war over, over a weekend. Um, and the key there was that, you know, Hitler didn't have to um, declare war on uh, America because he, did have, he didn't have a formal military alliance with Japan. There was nothing in the, 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 the alliance that they had which said that they had to go to war if they were attacked by somebody else. So he didn't have to go to war, but he always said that he would back up Japan in that way. Um, so he declares war on America. Now, a lot of historians have gone into this and thought, oh, God, this was such a catastrophic mistake. Didn't he realize what he was doing? Didn't he realize the war potential? The truth was, I mentioned it earlier, Hitler didn't see that. He knew America was a huge economy, but he actually thought they were an economy that produced consumer goods. So when he talked about America, he said, look at the way they've got Mickey Mouse and they've got you know, Ford's cars and they've got, you know, they've got, you know, chocolate and they've got Coca-Cola. And he saw it like that. It was a consumer society. He didn't really think it was a military society. And he didn't realize that it had this huge war potential. So when he actually declares war on America, he thinks, oh, it's going to take them a few years to build up their armaments. So for now, I can maybe still get the initiative in the Soviet Union and win it. 
even though I've had a setback, maybe I can recover and still win it. But Roosevelt had already decided that Hitler was the danger to humanity. You know, hit, I say, you know, that it's true. You know, we've got a pandemic. Hitler was a pandemic. Hitler was the most dangerous figure for the rest of the world because he wasn't going to come to any agreement with anybody else to stop having wars. You know, for Hitler, he wanted to dominate the world by force and he was going to carry on. He was addicted to war. You know, I've said it before, but, you know, Hitler was a war junkie. Mm. You know, war was his fix. That was his fix. It was a fix beyond actually deciding what he was going to do with it. And like somebody who's got some kind of addiction, they don't see beyond the next fix. And that's why we see the Hitler. What Hitler hasn't got is any idea of the big picture. You know, he knows a lot about history. He knows a lot about, you know, all the different powers in the world. His knowledge is, is massive, but he doesn't really think globally. And he doesn't think... Do you say think... his knowledge is selective? Um, his knowledge is, 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 you know, his knowledge is like the source of the kind of knowledge that might might have won him the specialist round on master a mastermind. <laughs> you know, that's the, it's that kind of knowledge. But you know, the, there was a famous program. You you two probably won't remember it. It was called uh, the Memory Man. He was called Leslie Welsh, and he came on the radio, BBC Radio, and you'd ask him any question. So they used to get the, the listeners to ask him a question. And the listener will come on and they say, who won, the, who won the FA Cup in 1925 or whatever it was? And he'd say, oh, it was, it was I don't know who it was actually, but he'd say, it was Arsenal. And he'd say, who was in the team? And he'd name the team. And say, who, who was on the other side? He'd name the other side. And he'd he's tell you how many... Wikipedia. Uh, yeah, he, he was like a, yeah, he's like a walking Wikipedia. But the problem with Leslie Welsh, the famous joke about Leslie Welsh is at the end of him telling you all the facts, you say... And why did they win, Leslie? <laughs> yeah. And then there's complete, there's complete silence. <laughs> and I think that's where Hitler is the same as Leslie, Wel Leslie Welsh. He could remember everything, but he couldn't tell you why. And he had no vision about, you know, globally of how he was going to win this war. Look at the way he manages the war. He's got the worst ally you could possibly uh, have in Mussolini. You know, Mussolini is the most useless ally anyone can have in Italy is useless in terms of providing any kind of uh, additional strength to Germany. On the contrary, Hitler spends most of his time bailing Mussolini out, he even rescues him. He even re you know, when he gets captured, you know, after the Allies invade Italy, he even rescues him and takes him back and puts him in charge of a puppet regime. And Japan, it's interesting, we always think of the, these, the Axis and Japan. Japan doesn't tell its main ally that it's going to attack <laughs> the, Amer the American fleet at Pearl Harbor. I mean, you think, wouldn't you, that if you had an ally, he might phone you up and say, oh, uh, Adolf, yeah, no, tomorrow the war's going to expand and we're going to bring America into it. No, no, no. Hitler doesn't tell Mussolini he's going to invade the Soviet Union. He doesn't tell Japan he's, <laughs> that, that, that he's going to invade the Soviet Union. So you see, they never coordinated their plans at all. They, they, in fact, you can say there are two wars going on. That's why I call it. There's a German-Soviet war and there's the Pacific War. Actually, three wars going on, really. And then there's the war with the Allies as well, which is another separate war. So th although we call it the Second World War, they're three separate wars, really. They don't, mm -hmm. all con they don't all connect up. For example, no British soldier fights in the Soviet Union. No Red Army soldier fights in France or fights in Africa, you know, and, and no uh, German soldier fights in Japan and no Japanese soldier fights in Italy or fights in Germany. So it's a strange alliance, really. Um, and that's, that's one of the reasons why, ultimately, you know, that, that, that the, the, the Axis loses the war, really, because it's not really... And that's why I say Hitler moves from his war junkie mentality and then once he gets into a war that he, he's struggling to win, then he, start, he starts to go to pieces then, really. This is where... So you've been hinting at it all, all along now, um, and obviously we know that the end is coming for him and that it is all going to... It's going to go to shit, basically. Um, so let's start looking at that, because the next thing you 
picked out is obviously defeat at Stalingrad in February 1943. So we're still focused on the East in terms of Germany. Um, and, and the book is called Disaster for a reason, isn't it? Yeah, because what happens is the disasters multiply. As we move through the book, the disasters multiply. You never you know, once we go, we go past, um, uh, you know, Moscow, you know, the, the disasters start to pile up for Hitler. But of course, like any sort of junkie, he sort of, what he does in 1942 is, he sort of, he, he has a kind of cold, bit of cold, not too much cold turkey, because he says, you know, I can't attack all across the Soviet Union, all across the frontier. So he picks out the South. He's going to attack in the South. Towards the Caucasus, uh, you know, uh, and try and capture the oil there. That's his main aim. And what happens is that goes completely wrong. He he can't actually he, he can't actually get the oil there. The, the Soviet Union holds him back, and it's between to, to get to the Caucasus. His troops have to pass through mountain ranges, and the Red Army has got so many people in this mountain range that the you know the leading general there is saying, "Look, we can't get through here." It's impossible to get through, and Hitler sacks him, gets somebody else, and then he's told, you know, we're not going to get through here. Halder, who is the leading general, says, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to win in the Caucasus. We're going to have to disengage, and he sacks. What does he do? Every time things go wrong, Hitler sacks is a general. You know, it's like musical chairs. Another general comes in, he makes a mistake, he sacks him. So you know, he's, it's, there's a kind of instability at the centre of this as well. And in 1942, when the Caucasus starts to go wrong, he then readjusts the plan to take Stalingrad. And then this becomes the next phase of the war where, where he tries to take Stalingrad. Now, when you look at it, even if he'd taken Stalingrad, because the Soviet Union held Moscow and held the Caucasus, things were looking bad. Remember, if you look globally, and that's why, you know, Stalin did look globally. You know, he did realize that his alliance with, with America was important. For example, even, even after the war, Stalin said, you know, I, I do acknowledge that, you know, American aid, military aid did make a big difference on the Eastern Front. He said, we started to have an army that was well equipped. Um, you know, they started to get American jeeps. You know, on the Eastern Front, all of a sudden, they're being outrun by these American jeeps, which were supplied. You know, their communications improved. They even got spam. <laughs> the Red Army soldiers had, had spam, just like the American soldiers. They, they supplied something like 50% of their food needs. So at Stalingrad, this is like a kind of another gamble by Hitler. You know, is he going to take Stalingrad? And here, who, who comes into the fray again? Yorgi Zukov comes into the fray. Um, I mean, there's a debate whether he decided on this encirclement move. But what happens is, is, is Zukov has a plan, and his plan is, he says, let's draw them into Stalingrad this time. Let them go into the city, and then we will mount a counteroffensive outside the city, and we'll encircle them, and we'll trap them. And lo and behold... It's called Operation Uranus, and it's and it's not just him. Vasilev is is, is the key architect of that. Although you know Zukov got into trouble because he took all the credit for it. But the the basic plan was agreed by the by the Soviet High Command, and even even Stalin said, "Do you really think this is going to work?" And he and and uh, Zukov said, "Yeah, I think you know what what they're not expecting is that we're going to make the main." burden of our defense outside the city he said so inside the city if our troops can hold them inside the city if we trap them they're finished and that's exactly what happens in november operation uranus goes into goes into effect and outside the city they've got weak romanian and italian troops are defending outside the city and so what they do is they link up they link up and they trap the sixth army of uh, Paulus inside Stalingrad. And that's when the sort of siege of Stalingrad happens. And I'd have to say, you know, the two aspects of this book that I'm very proud of is, is, the, is the, the, the parts about Stalingrad. Because, I mean, literally, I was there with a giant piece of paper drawing on that piece of paper the entire map of Stalingrad so that I understood quite clearly exactly where the... 
the units were inside Stalingrad because it's force in an ama amazing way. That in Stalingrad, um, if I can kind of describe it, Stalingrad was sort of wide, wide, not very wide, but long, leaning on the river, the River Volga. And it's along this big, long strip where all these factories are. They're called the factory district, all these different factories. And um, the fights go on for these factories. Um, between, you know, the, the 62nd Army by a guy called Shuikov. And um, he's an amazing character because he says, you know, I, I, I've, I've realized, he said, that the Germans, they don't mind riding in tanks, he said, but they don't like close combat. He said, so what happens is, he said, let's draw them into this factory district because you can't, you can't run around, he said, in a tank. It, you know, surrounded by barbed wire and fences within a, and buildings. And he said, and then we'll come into our own, he said. We're the street fighters. And they literally were the street fighters. They even had sharpshooters. I mean, those of you who've seen Enemy at the Gate, you know, with Jude Law playing the sharpshooter, that guy killed about 267 people. And he said later he used to enjoy waiting for a German officer to, 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 to have his morning coffee, he said. He said, little did he realize he was going to get a bullet in the head. Um, and the battle with his Stalingrad is just amazing. I mean, yeah. I, I think that I was writing this and I was thinking, you couldn't make this up. And, you know, because, of course, I'm coming to this and realizing, you know, I've got to pro provide something new here. And I think I do provide something new because I think when you look at that Stalingrad part, you'll say, God, this is so detailed. And, you know, at the level of, you know, fighting in the streets, you know, fighting for the tennis racket, which was the tennis racket. That's actually a railway loop that goes in the city or the Universa Mag department store. These are like things that I had to go into that detail to capture it. And I, I bring out the soldiers' accounts as well on both sides as well, how they gradually become, uh, they starve inside the city. A lot of young men, young German soldiers, they started to get what was called Stalingrad Heart. They suddenly mm. have a heart attack and die. Oh, wow. and, and hundreds of them started to die. So the Stalingrad to me is, is, a, is a massive, it's almost, it's almost kind of like a, it's, it's like an amazing, it's, it, I mean, it, it is an amazing film. I mean, I think that, you know, Enemy at the Gate was one aspect of it where it plays the sharpshooter. But I, but I actually think that, you know, I still think Stalingrad would make a great, a great Hollywood film, I think. Yeah. Um, we had, so, so we've that, had someone come on, talk to us about Russian and their, still their obsession with Stalingrad in popular culture. Haven't we, Alina? I forget when that was now. Oh, gosh, that's one of our first podcasts. It was, yeah. And it was yeah. fascinating to see still how it is in like the psyche of Russian people and that. But I just I can see you just gleefully with your giant bit of paper in Stalingrad having the time of your life wearing that beanie hat you've got on now. <laughs> yeah, it gave me uh, it, it 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 made me realise that you know when you when you're going to write about military history, you do need to know about the geography of it. Mm. The geography is so important. So I do bring in the geography, and I do bring in the uh, the armies who force in it. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of detail, but it's like sort of you know I I don't I don't I'm I'm because I'm at base, not a. Uh, military historian I mm. try to think of myself reading military history and as you know if military history gets too detailed you lose complete track of it as a reader and you give yeah. up you know I mean uh, there's a book a fantastic couple of books about the, the attack on the Soviet Union by John Erickson but I'm telling you you could not read them it was impenetrable because he was going down to the level of the 62nd combat unit. And, the, and now, you know, you're thinking as a reader, you think, where am I now? <laughs> yeah. You know, nobody, what, what a lot of the military historians don't realize is the reader can't take that level of detail because they'll, they'll lose track of what's happening. So I try and give detail where it's readable. And, and I go at the level of the armies and who's commanding the armies and things like that. But I don't go go down into the like minute detail of you know which battalion was you know you know sergeant so and so involved in because then I think you lose the reader then yeah I was gonna say it's like you've got five horrific if you're a Nazi years to cover um 
and only limited by well in two volumes so the five years for the second volume and how would you get it all in if you went down to that level it wouldn't yeah. exist you wouldn't be able to do it well it, but basically the chronology helped me because i could i could plan i could kind of um plan each chapter around the chronology so basically i created the chronology of the whole period which took me ages so basically, I had the chronology and then fitted everything into the chronology. So that's the way. I, w w they do it in films. It's called storyboarding. Yeah. So I storyboarded the whole book. So basically, I had these reams. Of, you know, the whole th I had chapters where there was already 9,000 words of chronology. And that chronology, I knew, would, be, would come out. Very rare when, you, when, a, when a historian takes 9,000 words and then takes them out. But of course, it, all it was was to guide me through the chronology. And because as I built up the chronology, other sorts of issues started to come up, which you normally wouldn't see normally if you were doing a the If you were doing it thematically, you'd never see some of these things. And some of them were quite fascinating uh, that came out. You know, some of them it might be that, you know, the, 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 uh, you know, the Hungarian prime minister shot himself. You know, and there was a mystery over it, but you don't really see that in a lot of other books. But of course, I because I was doing the chronology, I added that in. I thought, oh, that's interesting. And then you go and investigate on the basis. So you're investigating on the basis of the chronology. That's your starting point, really. And then you, you're kind of filling it all in. So your last one is uh, Hitler's Last Will and Testament, April 1945. Um, quote this is where the joke comes in is this where he decides that he's going to escape to argentina oh that luke daly groves is now pulling his hair out fellow <laughs> scouser is pulling his hair out because you've made that joke <laughs> and i had to underline that it is a joke before anybody <laughs> thinks that i'm being serious oh well i, I mean I, it's 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 a little bit like sort of you know i i i i am not a fan of conspiracy theories um, you know, not at all. You know, these people who think that, you know, 9-11 didn't happen or... COVID they, is fake. Yeah, they didn't land on the moon. Uh, Lee Harvey Oswald didn't kill Kennedy. Um, you know, wh what those conspirators... And this, this one, Hitler survived the war. I mean, anybody who knows Hitler in detail knows about, like me, knows about his personality, knows about the, what he said to everybody else, knows about how he felt about the war. The idea that Hitler, Hitler, you know, for all we may say about Hitler, you know, he, he was definitely patriotic about, you know, Germany winning the war. The idea that he would skulk off to Argentina, I just feel as though it, it does a disservice to Hitler himself. I don't think Hitler was that type of person to skulk off to Argentina. And then they say, oh, but Eichmann did. Yeah, but Eichmann, was, Eichmann wasn't Hitler. Eichmann yeah. was a horrible toady. Uh, underling, right? His natural thing was to be told by Hitler what to do. Or, you know, they mentioned that, you know, Mengele skulked off. Yeah, Mengele was a horrible doctor, you know, who, 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 who was looking out to save his own skin. They were different types of people. Eichmann was, was, a, was a bureaucrat. He was a bureaucrat who had no talent to do anything other than kill people and organize the killing of people. Hitler was a different kettle of fish the idea that he he got out the bunker and lived is just it's just farcical it's so farcical that i i, I wouldn't even listen to it there's no evidence i mean there was a program called um hunting hitler there's no evidence at all no They're doing it's a all whole like, series frank the final know, word apparently yeah, exactly but it's, it's it's bonkers you know and i don't i think i, I really think historians of any credibility shouldn't get involved in that. You know, they shouldn't be getting them. To, they shouldn't get involved in this idea that Hitler um, he lived and he escaped. You know what happened to Eva Braun? Then she escaped with him. You know, it's like you know, yeah. it's, it's, just, it's just madness, and it? it's like sort of oh yeah, Hitler. Yeah, it's like I mean, there was a famous. It was a very bad taste sitcom. There is a sitcom from the nineteen seventies where Hitler escapes to New York. And and he lives in this uh, he lives in this apartment block in New York, you know. But it's just it's just madness. It's just I, I think that what 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 historians should do is ignore things like that. I I ignore it. I don't even engage with it. 
you know, I know Luke engages with it because he wrote the book about Hitler and he engages yeah. with it. But there's no way I'm going to engage with people like that. I mean, you know, there are people out there, you know, Holocaust deniers who are kind of waiting to have an argument. And I'm sorry, I, I don't argue. You know, I, if you corner me in a pub and start an argument with me, I'll just say, look, leave it. I'm not going to argue with you. I've come here to have a good time. I've come here to have a good time, not to argue with you. Yeah, you, know, you can't fight uh, with stupid sometimes, can you? You, ca you can't fight yeah. with the ignorant. You know, the, the, you know, the, you know, you know. In the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. You know, and these people, uh, these people are are basically that that they, they are. You know, they they they're not. They've got no credibility. There's nobody I've ever seen on one of those programs who I would say, oh, right, so he's, so he thinks that Hitler lived, right? You know, if, if there was like a gang of people like Richard Evans and Kershaw and other, you know, historians of the Third Reich, you know, uh, Washman and people like that, if they all said he, he moved there, I, I might have a look at it. I don't, think, I don't think they'd change my mind on it. But I'd have a look at it because, you know, whatever the evidence was, the evidence here, as I think uh, is being seen, is so flimsy. So we're talking about something that that didn't happen. And history is about what did happen. And I'm more interested in what did happen. And I think Luke's book was very good because it, it, it sort of demolished it completely, I think. And I do do mention it in my book as well. Excellent. And he's a scout as well. <laughs> he is a scouter as well. And. Um, <laughs> Let's, so let's tell us what you did then, because you listed Hitler's last will and testament as another thing that was pivotal in your book. So how did you approach the end of adult? Well, I think that what I, what I do is it comes down gradually. Gradually what I show in the latter part of the war is that gradually he does start to accept that he's going to, you know, in his own mind, he starts to accept that he's going to lose. But he wants to go on to the end. So, you know, he wants to go on to the end. I think he wants to go on to the end for a, an historical reason. You know, he sees himself as a great historical figure. There's no doubt about that. And, you know, so in fact, Hitler wants to, can you see what I mean? He wants to be a martyr. He wants to, he wants to be like a, a Wagner opera and kill himself. So it fits in with his own narrative of himself, that he's a great figure in history. He's a great negative figure in history. You know, Hitler is not a great figure in history. That there's nothing there that we could say, oh, he left behind, you know, great works of reform. I mean, you know, look at Napoleon. You know, Napoleon, it was one of the greatest generals who ever lived. He left behind a huge legacy of how to fight wars. Even in military colleges now, you get taught about generalship. They mention Napoleon, or look at the code Napoleon, the, the French law. The French law that he created still exists now today. Now that is a, you know, that is a figure, not just of historical importance and significance, but long-term significance. There's nothing of Hitler that survives. He didn't leave anything that survived except, um, you know, and Alina knows this well, except these horrible mausoleums where they killed people, mm. right? You know, that's the only thing he left. The only thing he left is horror, shame for the whole German people, but nothing tangible, nothing that lasted, nothing that he did lasted. So for that reason, he's a negative historical figure. He's important, hugely important. He leaves a, he leaves a massive shadow over the world. There's no doubt about that. But as a person, he's not important, you know, because he didn't leave anything substantial to the world. Um, and he wasn't a figure like Napoleon. You could say, oh, you know, he did major reforms in France that lasted, or he was a general, you know, to rank, you know, I mean, Napoleon, let's face it, let's make no bones about this. Napoleon's one of the greatest generals who ever lived. <laughs> you know, there's very few politicians can claim that. And on the issue of the last will and testament, on that issue, what I try to show is that Hitler, when he's given the opportunity to give you his view, on what what was Germany's role in the war, he decides that it was all the fault of the Jews, that really the Jews were responsible for the war. They started the war. They were the people who pulled the strings of the Americans. They were the people who pulled the strings of Stalin. They were the people who pulled the strings of Churchill. And, and, he, and the fact that he says that right at the end, that he, he comes back to his biggest passion, which is the hatred of the Jews, 
tells you a lot about Hitler, that he did want to destroy uh, Judaism in the world. That was his big, that was his big plan. But also, interestingly enough, in, in that, in that, and also he does mention that he wants to kill himself, by the way. But, you know, these people say he escaped to Argentina. Oh, yes, you know, you, you write things down just because you've got an ulterior motive, right? Um, but another aspect of his last will and testament that, 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 that is important is that he says, even if, you know, in a long, in a long time in the future, you know, uh, you know, Germany revives, he says, uh, our aim should still be to capture territory in the East. Now, that's significant because that shows you that German-Soviet war was the key was like the key aim of, of, of the war that he started, um, it, the war he wanted in 1941. Frank, before we finish, please yeah. remind our listeners the name of your book. Okay, my book is called uh, The Hitler Years and the volume two is called Disaster and it covers the period 1940 to 1945. And if you want to see the previous volume, it's called Triumph, and it covers the years 1933 to 1939. And you can buy it as, you know, a book, or you can buy it as a Kindle, or very, you know, those of you who like audio books, the audio books are fantastic because they're not read by me. They're read by Paul McGann, who was oh, I Dr. Oh, love Hill. him. We've had and him on the show, and he's lovely. Friend of mine, Paul. Oh, nice guy. Another scouser. Yes. So just to remind everyone, it's out on the 10th of December, the book, which is obviously 10th, this week. 10th of December, just in time for Christmas, yeah. So an um, ideal Christmas so, gift, everyone. So it's, a book, so, so it's a book about a man who had a triumph, then he has a defeat, and then he refuses to accept it. I wonder hmm, who Where have we be. seen that before? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Frank... Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. It was okay. an absolute pleasure having you on this podcast. And um, do you know what your books speak for themselves? Everyone, if you don't own copies of Frank's book, sir, make sure you get out there and buy yourselves a copy because not only is he a fabulous speaker, he is also an excellent, excellent writer. Yeah. So Always you. trust a historian who just can talk endlessly about their subject because it means they know, they know what they're going on about. Exactly. Oh. Okay, ladies, thanks a lot. I enjoyed that. Join us tomorrow when Matt Pope will be with us to talk all about Boxgrove Man. This is the uh, book that he has just written. He very kindly came on a while back and gave us an overthought of Neanderthal people, because we're not allowed to say man, the Neanderthals. I can't remember. I've forgotten already. It was so many podcasts ago how you're supposed to refer to them. But anyway, his speciality at the moment is Boxgrove Man. So he's going to come on and give us some more prehistory, which we're very excited about. Don't forget that we do exist on Patreon as History Hack and on Patreon as well, which is Podbean's own version. Uh, Alina and I have had massive fun doing this in 2020, uh, but life is going to change quite a lot next year and we're going to actually have to go and earn a living, etc. If we want to keep up the regularity that we've been bringing you and the kind of guests that we've been bringing you and the workload, then we will need your help. So uh, if you join us on either of those platforms uh, marcus is currently working on some benefits for you so uh, there's going to be incentives for joining on either of those platforms we're revamping ourselves on both of them so don't forget to go in you can do as little as a dollar a month and it all goes towards keeping up history hack as regular as we've been able to bring it to you this year we are now on YouTube. We are posting all of our new episodes on there and we have our own channel and we are gradually posting all of the back episodes because we have been made aware of the fact that you can only find the last hundred on some platforms. So you can go and listen to your heart's content and laugh at the cartoons and have a great time. So do go over there and subscribe.